or live? Dr. Suntor. Welcome to Unremarkable Labs. Uh, one of our excellent uh, second year residents, Julie England, is going to present us a case today uh, for discussion. Uh, we have uh, also have uh, Nikayla on uh, to help with the discussion and uh, the uh, current leader of Unremarkable Labs, uh, uh, Natasha Mera. Excited Julie, for Julie's case. Let's get started. All right, so um, let's just let's just do the lab box first, Natasha. Um, okay. So this is a 35-year-old female who presents with concern for a seizure. Well, we have abnormalities. <laughs> Thought you might like it, Dr. Centaur. This is actually uh, quite excellent. This is. This is quite excellent. Um, so there's a couple of ways we could do this. I can just tell you what I think, uh, or we can let Nikayla decide what she thinks, and then I can critique it. Um, which way do you want to do it, Nikayla? Um, I can start off, and and I guess you could jump in wherever. Well, why don't you start, and then and then I'll I'll give commentary afterwards. Yeah. Um, well, look, just looking at the labs, uh, first of all, off with that VMP, um, the potassium is pretty low at 1.7. Um, chloride's a little elevated, and you have a low bicarb. Um, other than that, your BUN and creatinine look pretty normal. Glucose is relatively within normal limits. You've got, um, an elevated white count um, and hemoglobin and hematocrit look pretty okay um, and platelets are fine. So kind of, let's see. I, I mean, off, off the first bat, I, I, can't, I, I can't really, piece together anything unifying um, kind of for this potassium and um, low, low potassium and the high chloride. Um, I mean- so, so this actually is um, something that strikes me as I have, I have an idea of what could be going on. So the first thing that uh, I always look at is the anion gap, especially when someone has low bicarb. And if I calculate it right, it's 13. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. unless the patient had an extraordinarily low albumin, this is probably a normal gap acidosis. A lot of people call it a non-gap acidosis, but they actually have a gap. It's just a normal gap. Uh, so mm -hmm. to be technically, it's a normal gap acidosis. So we don't know for sure that she has an acidosis because we don't have a, a VBG or an ABG, but... In my experience, the, uh, if it's not a metabolic acidosis, it would be, have to be compensation for respiratory alkalosis. You really can't get your bike. You're not going to get your bicarb that low if someone has respiratory alkalosis. Um, she had just had a seizure, and it'd be interesting to know when this, these labs are done, because you often get a lactic acidosis right after a seizure. Uh, so hopefully the, these labs were more than an hour afterwards, because the, the lactate stays up for about an hour. Yeah, I would say they were more than an hour. Um, yeah. She had the seizure um, like at home and then she came into the ER. So. Right. So um, how, how do we approach a normal gap acidosis? We have to decide, are they losing bicarb uh, or are they unable to buffer the acid in uh, the daily diet? Uh, as I discussed with my team uh, today, uh, discussing a case, the daily uh, acid that we have to buffer is approximately one milliequivalent per kilogram uh, per day. So how do we buffer that? Uh, it's part phosphates, uh, and that's pretty standard. Uh, that's what we call titratable acids, but we can't really do much about that. And that's not how, that's buffering, but that's not how the body is making adjustments. The body makes adjustments 
with non-titratable acid or ammonium. The ammonium comes from the proximal tubule where glutamine goes to glutarate. It produces ammonia, and as soon as it gets in the proximal tubule, it gets protonated and becomes ammonium. That ammonium goes from the proximal tubule and at the sodium potassium two chloride co-transporter, our favorite place where loop diuretics work, it's, it's a small cation, so it goes into the interstitium as part of the countercurrent mechanism and goes back to ammonia, goes back to NH3. Then it, by passive diffusion, it goes from the interstitium into the distal tubule. Now the distal tubule acidifies the urine and therefore this is a great buffer system because you have microequivalents of acid producing milliequivalents of ammonium. That's why our urine smells the way it does, is the ammonium. So what could go wrong? Well, if you had really chronic kidney disease, you might not make enough ammonia, but this patient has a creatinine of one, so it's not chronic kidney disease. You could have uh, a proximal RTA. Not too many people have proximal RTAs with bicarbs this low. Uh, that can cause a hypokalemia. Um, we were talking today about uh, the possibility of Fanconi syndrome. Is this a patient who's on tenofovir, for example? Tenofovir can cause a Fanconi syndrome. Or is this patient taking acetazolamide uh, because she was going to go hiking in the mountains? Uh, or she was on acetazolamide or, or acetazolamide like drug because she has glaucoma, um, but that's probably very unlikely. Uh, then there's type four RTA. She doesn't have type four RTA because that's hyperkalemic and the high potassium inhibits the production of ammonia. And so we see that in, in people's type two diabetes often uh, when they uh, have hyporene and hypoaldo, they get hyperkalemia and they subsequently get a normal gap acidosis. Very common in clinic, very common with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, very common with spironolactone or pleromone. But that's, that's hyperkalemia. So all we have left is a distal RTA. So my first assumption would be that this is probably a distal RTA. How am I gonna check for that? I'm gonna check a venous blood gas uh, because I don't need, I'm not worried about oxygenation. So venous blood gas would be just fine for the acid base disorder. Um, I'm going to start giving her potassium, uh, and I'm going to check a urine pH because the urine pH, uh, should be, uh, probably six or higher. Now, why do people get a uh, distal RTA? There are a number of reasons, but the classic one uh, that's on boards is Sjogren's syndrome, although other rheumatological syndromes can cause it. There, there's some other reasons for uh, distal RTA, uh, but uh, in looking at this, I'd be very worried about a distal RTA. I'm going to guess the Y count is just up because she had a seizure. She's not really anemic. Uh, she's, uh, because of the seizure, that might explain her thrombocytosis. Uh, but I'm not going to get excited about those just yet, and I'll probably check them again tomorrow. So that's 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 what I get out of this. Uh, let's let's see what we learn about this person. That's just from the numbers. Any questions, ladies? Did that all make sense? Yes, I think this is something. This is one reason I picked this case is because this is a concept that I feel like I have to go over and over again. So it's just good to talk through it again. Good. Okay. So let's, let's, let's find out other than a seizure, what, what's going on with this lady. So, um, 35 year old female possible seizure. Uh, she, let's see, do you just want like the HPI? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, for the past week and a half or so, she's had kind of, um, nausea, vomiting, um, there's someone in her home that's tested positive for COVID. Um, she's not having any respiratory symptoms, but um, she does 
take seizure medicine and potassium supplements at home, and she's been able, unable to take both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and her other major complaint is that she's really very weak. Right. We can probably explain the weakness from the hypokalemia. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's also the possibility that she could be uh, have hypomagnesemia. What's interesting, nausea and vomiting usually causes a metabolic alkalosis, but she doesn't have a metabolic alkalosis. Um, and so I'm really interested in a good uh, rheumatological uh, review of systems. I want to know whether she has a dry mouth, dry eyes, and things like that, because Sjogren's is so high on my list. But just does she have rheumatological disease would be very interesting, because if she has rheumatological disease, even if it's not... Uh, hasn't been diagnosed as Sjogren's, uh, there's, there are overlaps with, all, with many of these uh, inflammatory rheumatological diseases. Um, so as far as uh, rheumatologic symptoms, uh, she doesn't really endorse any uh, joint pains, um, no specific rash. Um, she, she does say that she, um, along with this nausea and vomiting, she's had a little bit of like streaky, hem like it's unclear if it's hemoptysis or hematemesis, but a little bit of just bloody streaks coming up. Um, let's see, what other questions do you have, Dr. Fintor? Dry, dry mouth, dry, dry eyes. Yeah, no, no dry mouth, no dry eyes. Okay. She does have um, sort of chronic abdominal pain that she's been worked up for. So she has like a recent CT abdomen from about two weeks ago. Um, which was unremarkable. Um, she has not had diarrhea because no, diarrhea was, no in, diarrhea. Our mm -hmm. was in our differential. Um, so at, at this point, I'm really interested in uh, her past medical history and what uh, medication she's on. Maybe there's a medication that could cause this. Uh, most people who have hypokalemia uh, so could this be aldosteronism? I'd, I'd want to know whether she has a history of hypertension. Usually don't get a potassium that low from aldosterone, but you could. You, you could. Um, they, they're usually hypertensive. They usually have a metabolic alkalosis. They usually don't have a metabolic acidosis. So I'm trying to, trying to figure out if she has a distal RTA, why does she have a distal RTA? Right. Um, so I guess just to sort of finish out the HPI, um, the, the only other real complaint she has is, as I said, just sort of this diffuse weakness and diffuse muscle aches. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, because of the seizure, we did kind of like a neurologic review of systems and all of that was negative, no vision changes, no, no focal weakness. Um, and then moving on to, I guess we can do past medical history. Right. Um, so she does have a history of a seizure disorder. Um, she has a history of kidney stones. Um, she has some sort of, she says she has like some sort of kidney disorder that was diagnosed as a kid that she doesn't really know anything about. Um, and she also has congenital deafness. So this actually made for, when this is another reason I chose this case, it made for a very interesting interview because this patient communicates by American Sign Language and she is so weak that she can't physically move her arms. Um, so she, uh, couldn't sign her story to us. So it was both, it was mostly asking yes or no questions right. through ASL translator. And so it was a very interesting history to take. Yeah. So congenital deafness, I'm really not good on congenital kidney diseases. Um, and, and so I'm going to stop right now. And, uh, what do I think about congenital? I think Alports is always comes to mind, um, but I'm going to go look at congenital deafness and kidney stones. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if the kidney stones uh, is a major, uh, major clue or not. Um, and it certainly could be. Uh, she was certainly on a lot of potassium. Uh, so it's something that's causing her to, to lose potassium. Um, I'm still playing around with, with distal RTA because I, I don't know where else to go. Uh, what's LTX? Uh, levothyroxine. Levothyroxine. So, so I guess I didn't, she also has a history of levothyroxine, of uh, hypothyroidism, and then um, 
she has a uh, heavy menses and an iron deficiency anemia, which she's mm -hmm. currently being, uh, getting replacement for. Right. Um, just as an aside, uh, her hemoglobin looks pretty good. Um, yeah, she, she's been on replacement for a while. Um, her NCV is still like 73, um, but she's getting better from that. I'd probably give her some IV because, but I give everybody IV. So, okay, let's examine her. I don't think we're going to learn much from the exam. I think that it's really going to come down to some other studies and trying to figure out what this congenital uh, uh, kidney disorder is. Julie, just a quick clarification. So from the review of systems, it sounds like um, there were no vision changes um, or anything, but it baseline what any issues with her vision? No, um, she, I don't, she might wear glasses, I can't remember, but no, no issues with her vision. She can see just fine. Okay, cool. Well, we do have uh, lips and mucous membrane dry. And do we think she's volume contracted? Well, he's, she's tachycardic and her blood pressure is a little bit on the low side. Um, and so it, it may be that, that uh, she's really dry. It, it could also be that, uh, that this is a clue to Sjogren's, um, which I'm obsessed with, as you can tell right now, because I'm trying to think of what other situations are do anything other than distal RTA. I, I, can't, I can't get away from distal RTA right now because I don't know what else is gonna, is gonna cause this. And so I'm gonna look up, I have, to, I have to pull out the books and look up congenital distal RTA. I know there, are, there, there is congenital distal RTA. And so, cause kids can get it. In adults, it's almost always Sjogren's. And so we'll have to look that up. Uh, trying to replace her potassium is going to be uh, ex extraordinarily uh, difficult. Uh, I think giving her uh, bicarb is going to be worthwhile. Let's talk about how much bicarb we would give her. So about how much does she weigh? Um, she weighs, let me see. Um, let's, let's say she weighs 130 pounds. Okay, so we'll make her, let's make her a 60 kilogram woman, okay? So if she's a 60 kilogram woman, um, what's her bicarb deficit? Okay, let's talk about how you figure that out because that's actually a really interesting thing. And this is what I would do if I was taking care of this patient. So the goal bicarb is around 22. She'll feel a whole lot better when, when her bicarb is up at 22. So the, the deficit is 14 milliequivalents per liter of bicarb space. So now we have to figure out what the bicarb space is. The bicarb space is actually all the fluid space in the body. So 22 minus eight is 14. The bicarb space is approximately 50% of your weight. In younger women, it can be as high as 60%. In uh, older men, it can be as low as 40%. I just use 50% because we're, we're gonna titrate anyway. So it really doesn't matter. So in this lady, we have 30 times 14 is how much bicarb she's behind, which is, 420 milliequivalents. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to give her bicarb? So does anybody know how to give bicarb? Shoal solution, bicarb yeah, tab. That's, that's really slow. From what yeah, I so remember. That, this lady's weak. This, this lady needs bicarb right now. That's the fluid she needs is bicarb. You can build your own fluid bag. I know at the VA through pharmacy, you can um, put in however many mill equivalents you want. Um, obviously right. there's a cutoff. So yeah, what you usually do is you take a liter of D5 and W and then you either add two or three amps of bicarb to it. Mm -hmm. So how much bicarb is in an amp? 50. 50, mm -hmm. correct. So I would give her 150 mil equivalents fairly rapidly right now, then give her, then more slowly give her the next 150. By then we should be about two thirds of the way up because we're, we're trying to replace 420. And then 
decide how much to give after I've done that. But I would be pretty aggressive about giving her bicarb. I'd also be very aggressive about giving her potassium. How fast can we give her potassium? So we have, um, to, to throw a wrench in it, we have, of course, diff very difficult access. So when we admitted her, we had one tenuous peripheral IV. Yeah. I, you know, in this patient, I would have tried to get a central line in. Okay. I would try to get a central line because because she's so weak and she's going to and she's going to need a little bit more potassium than we can normally give. How fast can you give potassium IV? 10 milliequivalents per hour. Right. And you usually don't want to give it that fast because it, it yeah. burns so much. Yeah. In a really big vein that that might work. I tend to, to stick with five per hour uh, to try not to, especially in someone who has poor access, to, mm -hmm. so, so that I, so that I don't ruin the access for the future. Um, and then then we can try to give her oral also. So what the heck is Shoal solution? And why does it work? I just it's know called, it. It's also called Bicitra. That might be a clue. That's the, I think. I, I, I don't know actually what the composition of Scholl solution is. I just, it's just is my go sodium citrate. It's, it's sodium citrate. And I think by citrus, some sodium and some potassium citrate. I'd have to look it up. Here's the, here's the really cool thing. It's one milli equivalent per cc. Mm -hmm. So if you give someone 30 cc's of shoal solution, you've given them 30 mil equivalents of potassium and it's well absorbed. So we're gonna actually get the potassium in faster if we can give it orally while we're giving the IV. I'm still giving the IV, but uh, I'm for, for the bicarb, but I'm still gonna give that. Um, and certainly I'm gonna give oral, oral potassium also, but she's probably continuing to lose potassium. Um, what, if, what about giving her sodium bicarb tablets? So let's say we give her 650 uh, milligrams of sodium bicarb. How, how, much, uh, how much bicarbonate is there? Nobody knows the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do go by molecular weight, uh, you can add the molecular weight up of sodium bicarbonate. And you remember from chemistry, sodium is 23, hydrogen is one, carbon is 12, oxygen is 16, multiply that by three, add all those up and you get 84. You believe me? Then when you get that 84, you divide it into the 650 and it comes out to 7.7. .7. So just think 7.5, because we're also gonna give 1300 mil equivalent tablets and those are approximately 15 mil equivalents. So we're gonna have to give two 1300 mil equivalent tablets to be the same as 30, milli, 30 cc's of Scholl solution. So let, let's talk about what it means to the patient when you do this, because we're gonna do this in a lot of people with chronic kidney disease, and you've all seen patients, especially on the renal service, who are on sodium bicarb. Sodium bicarb causes a lot of gas, and a lot of patients find that gas uh, very discomforting. On the other hand, Scholl solution or, or sodium bicitra tastes horrible. So it's a liquid. And if you think of concentrated lime juice with a salt shaker in added to it, that's what Scholl solution tastes like. It has that, it has that citrusy taste because of sodium citrate, and then has a salt taste because of the sodium. And it's really not very pleasant at all. So we use them both. Um, the nephrologists seem to prefer to give sodium bicarbonate tablets. Uh, I think it's because they get, it's easier for the patient than taking home huge bottles of, of sodium citrate. And uh, the patients complain more about the taste uh, than anything else. So in the meantime, we're giving her bicarb, we're giving her potassium as fast as we can, but we really need a urinalysis. Yes. Um, so just to just to officially diagnose her acidosis, we have a VPG there. Yeah, um, as expected. Yes. Yeah, and that's and I'm really glad that you got a VBG. That's the right thing to do. Um. So yeah. So we, our her lactic acid was normal. 
other notable labs, just um, her phosphorus was one. Um, so we were also trying to aggressively replete that. Um, and then her urine studies are down below Dr. Centaur. Um, the one you asked for, the urine pH is six. Yeah. And in this situation, this urine pH should be five. So this, this really does suggest a um, distal RTA of some type. So now we have to go to the books and find out whether or not that's related to her con congenital condition uh, or not, or is this something new? Um, I also like the fact that you have a urine potassium and a urine sodium. She's her kidneys are respond, responding appropriately, trying to conserve potassium. The urine potassium is much lower than the urine sodium, so this is uh, this is not uh, an aldo problem. If it was an aldo problem, she'd be uh, if you give a, if you give someone a lot of aldo, you lose potassium. So the urine potassium would be higher than the urine sodium. So we know it's not a, an aldosterone problem. Um, I think it's very interesting that she's hyperkalemic. Well, she's not really, uh, uh, I was going to say hypercalcemic, correction, hypercalcemic. But with that albumin, she's not really high, hypercalcemic. Uh, her phosphate is 1.0. That makes me think of Fanconi syndrome because you, you do get phosphaturia with Fanconi syndrome. That's very dangerous to have uh, phosphate of 1.0. This could just be from Renage and vomiting but uh, you, you have to be very aggressive at trying to uh, treat that phosphate because that can kill you. The fact that her mag is normal means that it's not one of those, uh, it's not like Barter syndrome or something like that, but all those cause metabolic alkalosis. So what I'm doing now is I think she does have a distal RTA. The question is, is this, uh, is this a, an acquired distal RTA or is this a longstanding distal RTA that they're having a hard time uh, treating? Uh, if it is, if it is long-term, I'm surprised that uh, she, uh, well, I guess they're, they're using potassium citrate to try to keep it under control. Maybe she uh, finds those medications uh, difficult to take and doesn't take them uh, with, with great adherence. Uh, and, and I'm sure that if she's had this since she was a kid, uh, that, uh, it would be, uh, fairly annoying to have to take these medicines all the time. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was, if that was a problem. Um, so teach us something. What, what does she actually have? So, um, so yes, Dr. Centaur, we repleted her potassium. We gave her bicarb, probably not as elegantly as you just described. Um, but it was, to me, one of the big learning points in this case was like, when we saw her in the ER, she was like almost paralyzed. Like she could not lift her limbs up off the bed because, and then um, by the time we got her up to the floor, her potassium had come up to about 2.7. And I walked by her room and she was sitting there with one of her arms over her head. And so it was just this like incredibly drastic change when she, once we got her potassium up to even just, you know, upper twos. Um, so that was a big learning point for me. And then um, we got genetics involved and she actually has a distal renal, a distal RTA uh, due to genetic mutations in ATP6V1B1 and atp 6 v OA4 genes. Um, so her, um, this, this is where a little bit of the question mark comes in. They, they think that her congenital deafness is related, but it's a little bit unclear. Um, and her kidney stones are related. Um, and I'm, I can, it's, it has to do with how her RTA works, but she, but basically, um, if she, the way her RTA works puts more calcium in her urine and increases her risk of kidney stones. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, that's, and so we got her, interestingly, our hospital does not have potassium citrate. So we kind of had to make do with um, the potassium chloride. Um, but once we got her BMP looking better, she got better. Um, and we attributed her seizure to one, not being able to take her, uh, Kepra because she was nausea vomiting and two, uh, her electrolyte disturbances, so. Certainly the hypophosphatemia at one in and of itself could cause seizures. Okay. Uh, that's, that's one of the risks of that. 
let's let's um, flesh this out. So distal RTA uh, is one of the three ways that hy severe hypokalemia presents with quadriparesis. And I've, it, for distal RTA, it's sort of a classic that they come in with, with uh, they can come with quadriparesis or almost quadriparesis. So there's three possibilities. Someone has severe hypokalemia and, and enough to get quadriparesis. One is that they have acidosis and that's virtually always a distal RTA of some kind. The next is they have alkalosis. And uh, we actually, uh, I actually had a patient about 15 years ago who came in with uh, uh, an, an aldo uh, tumor uh, that, that we were finally able to remove. And he came in with quadriparesis with alkalosis. So mm -hmm. we, we, so we, now we have acidosis and alkalosis and they have a normal pH. Well, what would that be? Say it again. You have a normal pH. pH and, and hypokalemia, severe hypokalemia. Hyper, hyperaldosteronism? No, that, that's hypo, that's hypokalemia. Yeah, okay. that, 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 that's a me metabolic alkalosis. Huh. It's, uh, it's a hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Oh. Often triggered by hyperthyroidism, but not always. Seen more often in the Far East, uh, although there uh, is quite a bit from Mexico also. So those three will all present, could all present with quadriparesis. Those, those are the hypokalemic versions of, uh, uh, of quadriparesis. Uh, the, my guess is the phosphate has something to do with this mutation uh, that she also needs to take more phosphate than most people. Um, but, but knowing nothing about that mutation, I would have to talk to the genetics people to find out. It's not surprising. There's something similar, and, and I don't know what it is, between the genetics of the kidney and the ear, because there are quite a few uh, genetic kidney disease that also have uh, uh, deafness with them. But that's as much as I can tell you. Uh, the congenital it, deafness was, was a huge clue that this was some kind of uh, uh, a genetic disorder. As much as, I, as much as I tried to make it uh, Schultz, uh, uh, Sjogren syndrome. I think the connection between the kidney and the ear, if I remember correctly, it has to do with the basement membrane is is it's the same type of like collagen okay i'll buy that thank so, you that's yeah, really good and, yeah so i think I, that that's that's about all i can say but that, that was more than i could say <laughs> uh I, I i i know that that's something i need to ask somebody because i don't need to remember that <laughs> that one i don't need to remember i just need to remember that i could ask somebody so now that we've gone over this, and that was a beautiful presentation, I want each, each of uh, our, our three second year residents to tell me the two most important things they think they learned from this discussion. So we're, we're gonna let uh, Nikila go first. Um, I think the biggest thing I learned out of this case um, definitely is um, the bicarb replacement because I think when we replace bicarb in the hospital, it's just kind of, I, we're like, we start at like 30 TID of troll solution. And if it's not working, you bump it up to 45. And so it's just kind of like a lot of guesswork. And so the, this kind of the calculation um, and how you actually figure out how much is your deficit. That was um, something that I found really helpful. And I think just overall um, talking through the different types of RTAs um, and the difference between a type four being hyperkalemic versus like the proximal and distal being more on the hypokalemic side um, and kind of going over the few causes of each of the different types of RTAs. Natasha, what, what did you get out of this? Um, so this was something 
I've probably learned for the third time now, but the association between distal RTAs and Sjogren's syndrome, um, it's not something that I've committed. So hopefully third time's the charm. Um, and then I agree with Nikila about the bicarb calculation. Um, and then I didn't realize that sodium bicarb tabs cause GI upset either. That's kind of important from a patient adherence perspective. Well, they, they cause gas because as soon as you break down sodium bicarb, you produce CO2. So you have all the CO2 Makes in your sense. GI tract. Yeah. You just have to ask them. Uh, some people like it and some people it doesn't bother and some people it really bothers. Julie, so it, it was your patient. What did you get out of this discussion? Um, so I, I, have, I have to say, after having this discussion, I probably would have um, repleted her electrolytes a little bit differently. Like I, of, I didn't calculate her bicarb deficit. Um, so, so having that in my tool belt, um, I think basically what we did was we just tried to get as much bicarb and potassium in her as fast as we could. And so, oh, sure. Um, oh, so. And, and, and there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think what's interesting is how profound her bicarb deficit was. And right. so what the calculation did is it just it told you it's going to take a lot of bicarb. Right. It's going to take a lot of bicarb. The other thing that, I, that you, you demonstrated so well is how surprised you were about the tipping point of hypokalemia. So like the patient that I saw who had, uh, had an aldosterone uh, adenoma, he was working in the fields one day and the next day he was quadruparetic and they gave him potassium. And by the time I saw him, he's no longer quadruparetic. Mm -hmm. uh, but he'd been hypertensive for a long time. And it was interesting, nobody had ever diagnosed him, but he'd been on spironolactone for a number of years uh, he was an undocumented worker, and for some reason, he was no longer on spironolactone when he came in. But, but uh, fortunately, we're, we were able to get him uh, surgery uh, so that he'd go back to, and work in the fields. Yes, then, and that was a big like when I saw this when I saw this patient. That was a big learning point for me. Was I mean, I knew potassium like hypokalemia could cause like muscle weakness and muscle pains, but to see it to that severity. And then to see it reverse so quickly with repletion was was just like really um, profound to see in person. Um, and then Dr. Centaur, from our discussion, probably uh, I guess one of the big learning points for me, like learning, you know, RTA proximal and distal RTAs from a medical medical school standpoint. I guess we really focused more on the congenital um, sides of them. And so when I think distal and proximal RTAs in my mind. I'm like, oh, that's just a bunch of congenital stuff that I don't know anything about. Um, but in preparing for this talk, I learned about the association with Sjogren's syndrome and all these other reasons for acquired RTAs. And so that was a big learning point for me is um, thinking of those things in an acquired setting. Yeah. Um, uh, if I'm right, uh, myeloma can cause proximal RTA. Yes. Yeah. I, I learned that when I was preparing for this talk. Yeah. Um, so the, so the myeloma proximal RTA is not a Fanconi syndrome. Uh, if this was a proximal RTA, we would have had phosphaturia, we've had glycosuria and amino aciduria. And so the, the trick to diagnosing Fanconi's, and I saw a patient who had it from, uh, tenofovir a number of years ago, they had, they had like three plus glucose in their urine with a totally normal gl glucose and no history of diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they had uh, a, a bicarb of about 18 and I knew they were on tenofovir and I knew tenofovir, the, the old salt that they used to use was much more common to cause uh, Fanconi syndrome, but the newest one can, uh, the newer one can still, there's still reports of Fanconi syndrome with it. Uh, so that it, that's just one of those things you need to know. So, well, thank you so much for presenting this. I hope that uh, everybody who is watching us have this discussion learns a little something. Uh, and uh, if, if, uh, if you happen to be uh, medicine pediatrics, you probably understood this better than we did. Thanks. <laughs>